SBS advises that the following program includes depictions of drug use. Canada is in the grip of an overdose emergency. Nearly 600 dead since the beginning of the year and the province still not close in finding a solution to the toxic drug crisis. Since 2016, around 35,000 Canadians have died of drug overdose. 80% of those by the misuse of a powerful and addictive painkiller, fentanyl. A grain this big is enough to kill. And it's making its way to Australia. We're here to ask what we can learn from this deadly epidemic and the fight to save lives. I'm in British Columbia on Canada's west coast. Flanked by mountains, rivers and pine forests, it's a province teeming with natural beauty. But beneath these postcard views lies the highest rate of fentanyl death in the country. On average, six people die here every day from overdose. Hey guys, I'm just releasing this video just cause like maybe when I'm better at YouTube, um, I can look back on this and laugh and some. He was precocious and smart. He started his own YouTube channel when he was 10, against my wishes, but he knew how to do it. He loved snowboarding, snow skiing, water skiing. He was good at almost anything he tried. It was Saturday, Easter weekend, six o'clock, and I said, I'm just making dinner. And he said, call me when it's ready. And so he went into his bedroom and was watching YouTube videos in his chair. And uh, dinner was ready and I knocked on his door and he was slumped over in his chair. I called 911, I couldn't revive him and did CPR. And uh, three months later, the coroner said that he had a very small amount of fentanyl in his system. And the coroner said he must not have had any tolerance because it was such a small amount. Ronan was just 16. He didn't have adverse childhood experiences. He didn't grow up in poverty. He didn't grow up with abuse or violence, you know? He had a pretty good life and he was a pretty happy kid. He took what he thought was his annex recreationally. But he didn't want fentanyl and he didn't want to die. Looks very happy. Yeah, I got a first medal. Ronan died because fentanyl is getting mixed in with we other drugs. In Canada, 15 to 24 year olds are now the fastest growing group being hospitalized for opioid overdose. I've met uh, five or six other moms like me where their kids were experimenting and died, all in the Vancouver area. Two of them thought they were snorting cocaine, but they were 16 years old. One was 15. I thought fentanyl, people died from fentanyl who were intravenous drug users on street entrenched, like on our downtown east side. That's who I thought died of fentanyl. I didn't realize that people could die from taking a pill. Vancouver's downtown east side has a long history of marginalized people and drug use. This is also where fentanyl first emerged in Canada. Abuse and things of that nature, you know, it's usually, that's the number one cause for people using. Trust me, I didn't want to become an addict. Hugh Lampkin has lived on the downtown east side for the past hey, 20 is it years. Yes. Hi, Hugh. It's Evan. It's a little messy because we had a. This is our first dog to be born here. <laughs> now nursing a chronic back injury, Hughes cycled in and what out of heroin here, addiction most of his life. 
as a way of trying to deal with childhood abuse. He can clearly recall the moment in 2014 when fentanyl arrived on the scene. Right. We found out that what they did is they very slowly um, put fentanyl in their heroin little by little by little by little until they got to the point where they knew by the time they, they got to this point, you go wired for life. It's very hard to get off of it. Like I've never seen anything like this before. Like it, it really grabs a hold of you by the by the clothes and is when you must have it. You know, it's 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 crazy. Last year, half of the 564 overdose deaths in Vancouver were in this part of the city. I can't go to the old anymore. I feel that I disrespected my friends, but I go, but I just I can't I can't go in yet. I can't take it anymore. I'm tired of seeing people lying in coffins dead. To try and save as many lives as he can, Hugh helped set up this overdose prevention site. This is the injection room. It's a place where users can do drugs, but under supervision, and get help immediately if they overdose. Everybody brings their own drugs with them. We don't supply drugs to anybody. Australia has just two supervised consumption sites like this. But Canada has almost 40 across the nation. These facilities have become a front line to reduce the wave of deadly overdose. John is a drug user and Hugh's colleague. It's like you're super rough boy. Huh? He's personally saved 30 people from overdose. The 30 people yeah. you've yeah. saved, yeah. how many of those people were, were OD'd on fentanyl? All 30. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. There is no such thing as a heroin market here in New Vancouver. No such thing. I've, I've, I, I know the major, I know most of the major dealers. I know how they cook it. I know what goes into it. There's three main ingredients. There's fentanyl, mannitol, and caffeine. And usually uh, some kind of keek dye to put a color in it. And that's it. Easy to hide, addictive, cheap and potent, fentanyl has become the perfect cutting agent to improve profit margins on everything from heroin to fake prescription pills. And that's exactly why Australian authorities are on edge. Single largest detection of fentanyl Australia's ever seen. Last year, they intercepted 11 kilograms of fentanyl coming from Canada. That's 5.5 million lethal doses, enough to kill the entire population of Sydney. But to addiction medicine specialist, Dr. Christy Sutherland. Nice to meet you. I'm well, thank you. Yeah. Nice to see you. Fentanyl is a useful pharmaceutical. We use it in medicine all the time. Like if you were in terrible pain and went to the hospital with a broken leg, you probably would get fentanyl. Dr. Christie's been working with Vancouver's most Primary vulnerable care people does. in the downtown And then in addition to that, I do the specialty in addiction. She's watched fentanyl take hold. Most people did not want to transition to fentanyl. It is much more potent than heroin. So people who were previously acclimatized to heroin, their brain adjusted to this new potent opioid and so that they have a heavier opiate need in order to stay out of withdrawal. Well, when my patients are really stuck in a cycle of drug use, they're quite vulnerable. They're vulnerable because of the drug they're buying. They're vulnerable because of um, engaging with the illicit drug market. So I was hoping to separate my patients from that ongoing uh, vulnerability that they had by creating this alternate system where they can access drugs in a way that's safer. It's regulated and thoughtful in a way that I hope reduces those public health harms. In a world first program, Dr. Christie is fighting the fentanyl crisis by selling pharmaceutical grade fentanyl to drug users. So after they've checked in, they come into the back to see the nurse to get their dose of the day. So everyone's dose is titrated to specifically what they need in terms of their tolerance. And we were incredibly surprised at the how high the doses have to be. So we're giving people 25,000 micrograms of fentanyl four times a day. Uh, so if you were in labor and giving birth to a baby, you might get 100 micrograms or 200 micrograms. 
often for people who are using opioids, it's the criminalization of their lives that is causing the harm. They have to engage in a sex work or a crime to get their drugs. And then when they do buy the drugs, they don't know what is in it. That it could be any percentage of fentanyl. So if you eliminate the violence, the need to do crime, they can exit from sex work, and then they have a caring nurse and a primary care doctor who will wrap them in services, you see people get better. Then at the same time, we see them overdose less. What impact does it have on their continuing need for, say, fentanyl? Often people think that if drug users have access to drugs, they'll all take the maximum dose and be on it forever. But what we can see from the research and what I have seen in my clinical experience is that when people are on a high intensity program like this and stabilize, they want to move on. Since 2019, Canada has been trying to combat overdose by dispensing opiate alternatives similar to methadone. It's called safe supply. But Dr. Christie is going much further by supplying fentanyl, and this has provoked high level political resistance. There is no safe supply of these drugs. They are deadly, they are lethal, and they are relentlessly addictive. Canada's conservative opposition leader, Pierre Polyev, calls for tougher policing on the illegal supply of fentanyl. We need to bring in tougher laws for the violent reoffenders and the gangsters and organized criminals who are preying upon these addicts. He also slams the Trudeau government's houses, possible decriminalization of small amounts of hard drugs no, across the country. Beyond just subsidizing deadly drugs, now he wants to decriminalize crack, heroin, cocaine. This policy is insane. It is killing people. It's clear and simple and wrong to say everyone should just stop using drugs. It's not going to work. It's, it's never happened in the history of humanity. It's funny that we're so stuck in it with this like sort of public love of prohibition and punishment for people who use drugs, when really re-envisioning a different world would be less costly, there'd be less death and then less suffering. To me, it's policy change. Uh, it's not that radical. Where Dr. Christie has the approval from local authorities to run her program, I'm about to meet a rebellious group taking the concept even further without permission. So right now I'm bagging up heroin. They operate on the cusp of legality, and TV cameras have never been in this room. The three drugs we sell, cocaine, heroin, and meth, we sell them for the price that we get them, so we don't make any profit. This is the Drug Users Liberation Front, or DOLF for short. It's where a select group of users can buy illicit drugs free from contaminants like fentanyl. Lots of people you know, don't get their drugs checked, or if they do, it's just once in a while. So when people get it from us, basically they're getting their drugs checked every single time they use. 27 years old, Jeremy has university degrees in public health and biology. Working at safe consumption sites and drug checking centers, he's been trying to prevent overdoses since 2017. People need to know what they're using. They buy something off of the, the street, who knows what it'll be cut with. Sometimes they're buying drywall um, instead of actual drugs, or sometimes their cocaine is cut with pig dewormer. Somebody who is intending to do cocaine or intending to do meth uh, accidentally gets fentanyl in their drugs, um, they're, they're going to overdose. Um, and if nobody's around to, to save them or revive them, uh, they're likely gonna die. So yeah. now, here's a big question, Jeremy. Is what you're doing here right now legal it's a gray zone it's a gray zone by the written law no it's it's illegal to possess sell um and distribute drugs um but in the context of a public health emergency um which is a, a legislative tool um that public health officials have we need to do everything we can to stop this so you know is it illegal to save people's lives i'd say no um and the reason why we're doing this is we feel like we can, or we can argue that in court. We think that's a, that's a good argument, and so do our lawyers. Eris Nix is a co-founder of DULF. She's going out on a limb to save lives and doesn't like being compared with dealers. We're not fucking drug dealers. We take a slice of the illicit market, you know, we test it rigorously, and then we reintroduce it at cost without turning a profit. They're the horrendous, I don't know if you've ever sold drugs professionally, but it's a, not a very smart business model, if that's hmm. what you do. Both Jeremy and Eris are convinced the next response to the overdose crisis should happen in the halls of power. 
what would you like to see happen? Solution so rational. I'm like, talk to, I'm like, the, the drug issue is not a criminal issue, it's not a medical issue, it's a political issue, right? I'm like, you regulate the drug supply, you don't have overdoses. Do you have more people using drugs? Sure, but then you build out your system of recovery and you build out systems that actually work. I think there's not like winning. I'm like, what do we, we sell fucking heroin to 42 people. We traffic a kilo of heroin a month. That was a lot of fucking heroin to illegally traffic for some fucking bum bum that lives down the street. You know, I didn't want to do this. So basically we're fucked and it's like AIDS in the eighties when they were like, it's gay cancer, I hope these fans fucking die. But this time it's like, I hope these drug users fucking die. But in the nine months that this project has been running, no one has overdosed or died from consuming their drugs. And with this unlikely duo documenting every aspect of the project, they're determined to show their critics a model that works. Our end goal is to have it expanded, have, you know, health authorities or you know, non-profits be able to, to take this on sustainably and, and keep it rolling um, and hopefully save a lot of lives. It's really important to get out there that it's not just 30 and 40 year olds that are dying. It's it's young people, it's teenagers. And the other day I heard a 12 and 13 year old that had died. Deb and Lizzie are part of a group called Mums Stop the Harm. It's a nationwide network with over 3,000 members, all of whom have lost loved ones to overdose. Edward, my daughter who, who died, uh, she told me of a time when she was given uh, fentanyl from a Burnaby dealer and she said but I'm never doing it again mom was awful <laughs> so when she got drugs tainted with fentanyl like so many of them she didn't know that it you know that was what was in there Deb's 22 year old daughter Ola died five years ago after consuming heroin laced with fentanyl when I joined mom stopped the harm after my daughter died what I found was um, these are people just like me, you know. These are people just like me who have lost their kids. They're nice people. They were good parents. Um, and yet they've lost, the, you know, something that is immeasurably, you can't measure how, how deep the pain is when you, when you lose somebody like that. Basically, the last thing I stepped down from my... The group has recently launched a campaign called yeah. Sudden Silence. It aims to make people aware that fentanyl is not just killing drug users living rough. It's cutting a deadly swathe through middle-class Canada as well. We made the posters, banners, and um, the idea then is to have those banners travel all around and be put up in public places to let them know these, these people are us. You know, it's not somebody else. They're, they're our kids. They're who we are, right? And it could be your kid. If they're not some uh, pod of, you know, losers over here or something like that. Here's Dawn. She's a lovely person. This was her son, Marco. Wanted to be a chef. Lovely guy. And then you see Karma. And then you, that girl? You're kidding. What, what, what could have happened to that girl, Gemma? And then you read this story and you go, wow, that, that kid should still be alive. Or, you know, this is a, a teacher. She was a teacher. Okay, here we go. More people the group is calling for changes to drug policy, from the availability of addiction services and no, opiate alternatives the for to reducing the stigma associated with drug use. We have these systemic barriers that make it difficult for people to get help. And I, th I said, and I've said many times, it should be as easy to get some help as it is to get the drugs. Deb's mission to help the lives of drug users and their families is driven by a deep sense of loss. It's something she wants to help others avoid. It was five years before I started to see colour in the world again, before um, I could, you know, laugh at a joke, before I enjoyed a lot of things, because, um, you know, the death of a child is so deep and all-encompassing. And even though your child isn't there physically, they're with you all the time. So you have to get used to that because it's a relationship of a different kind, not the one you want, but it's the one you got. Here we go. Deb is taking me to a protest. It's the seventh anniversary of the declaration of British Columbia's overdose emergency. 
with almost 12,000 dead in this state alone since the 2016 declaration, today is a grim milestone. They've called it this year the horrible parade, and it's a horrible parade against horrible drug policy that is killing people. The seventh year of a public health Eris from Dolph is leading the protest, bringing together activists and grieving loved ones to demand more from the Canadian government. No matter how badly you punish them, people will always use drugs and people deserve to be able to live and you cannot recover someone if they have died. Mothers, social workers and drug users marching to the chant, safe drugs. The crowd here is calling on the government to allow safe supply in a non-medical setting. They want the sale and distribution of meth, cocaine, heroin and other illicit drugs to be regulated, safe and most importantly, fentanyl free. We're trying to show the government safe supply isn't a fucking rocket surgery. It's pretty simple. We can do it right here ourselves, right? We're going to save each other. But not only that, we're going to save all the fucking stockbrokers and everyone everywhere else who's doing drugs. Everywhere across Canada, we are digging the grave for the drug war today because we're so fucking sick of digging graves for each other. <laughs> Through good police work, or perhaps good luck, fentanyl hasn't hit Australian streets yet. But for those with lived experience here, there's a clear warning for Australia. You're about to face something that looks like Vietnam War when the bodies are coming home. Warn people about this stuff. Warn, warn people as much as you can. This drug is indiscriminate and kills people who are experimenting, but it kills people who are recreational and using, and it kills addicts. Hey, hold on. Hold on. Pam's 16-year-old son, Roman, died after taking a counterfeit Xanax that was tainted with a tiny grain of fentanyl. If I had known about these counterfeit pills, like I would have loved to have this conversation with him and any other teenager I know. Oh, I think of my boy every minute of every hour of the day. It's like having an amputated limb and you have these phantom pains. I just miss so much. It's like not just missing him, it's all the things he could have done. He would have had an interesting life. He had so many crazy wild dreams and I encouraged all of them. I just want to say thank you for watching this. Uh, please subscribe, even though I haven't re even released any content yet other than this. Anyways, yeah, thank you. Please subscribe and goodbye.